Good afternoon. My name is David Gunfner. I am the Senior Strategist for State Affairs at the Mackinac Center. We thank all of you for joining us today and welcome you to today's program, uh, Tax Cuts, Regulatory Freedom, and more in Washington and the 50 states, a conversation with Grover Norquist. Depending on your perspective, Grover Norquist is either the Darth Vader of conservative politics and the dark wizard of the right, or he's a principled voice for smaller government and more freedom for individuals. The longtime president and Amer Americans for Tax Reform, oh well that didn't work, it was a better idea. Um, the longtime president of Americans for Tax Reform has been a major political player in Washington DC and all across the nation for decades. At Norquist's urging, in 2017, the United States passed the first major federal tax cut in decades, flattening the code and lowering taxes for virtually everyone. He has also been key in arguing for lower regulatory burden, something the Trump administration has largely been taking up. On the other hand, the federal government has continued to increase spending and the president has urged heavy restrictions on vaping. The Mackinac Center is pleased to host a Q&A with Grover Norquist to discuss these issues and more. Grover Norquist is president of Americans for Tax Reform, a taxpayer advocacy group he founded in 1985 at the request of President Ronald Reagan. ATR works to limit the size and cost of government and opposes higher taxes at the federal, state, and local levels and supports tax reform that moves toward taxing consumed income one time at one rate. ATR organizes the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, which asks all candidates for federal and state office to commit themselves to writing to the American people to oppose all net tax increases, and there is a new signer of the pledge as of this morning. In the 115th Congress, 212 House members and 45 senators have taken the pledge. Beyond Grover's policy leadership on a wide range of issues, he has written four books. He holds an MBA and a BA in economics, both from Harvard University. He lives in DC with his wife, Sama, and two daughters. Interviewing Grover today will be Jarrett Scorup, the Mackinac Center's Director of Marketing and Communications. He's worked in a variety of roles at the center since 2009 and is the center's subject matter expert on occupational licensure, regulatory reform, and asset forfeiture. Jarrett's work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, National Public Radio, MLive, Detroit Free Press, Detroit Free News, and many newspapers across the country. He is a graduate of Grove City College with degrees in history and political science. He also studied political science or economics and religion. <clears throat> At the end of Grover's conversation with Jarrett uh, will be a time for your questions. If you have a question, uh, you will see note cards in the center of your table. Please write your question on the note card, hand it to one of our staff, and uh, they will give the cards to me, and assuming it's on topic, I will pose it to Grover. Ladies and gentlemen, Jarrett Scorup and Grover Norquist. Thank you, thanks for coming. Thank you, David, for that introduction. <clears throat> so when I, was a, when I was a college student, I, I got the privilege of, I was a research assistant for a professor, a guy named Dr. Paul Kengor, who was a Reagan biographer, so I got to research that a lot. And uh, I know, Grover, you got your start, um, or maybe not your full start, but became more prominent during the Reagan administration. And Reagan used to tell a story um, about uh, that he liked to, to show. Reagan was kind of eternally an, an optimist. So he'd tell this story that there were uh, some parents that were concerned. They had two twin boys um, that were seven-year-olds. And uh, one, of the, one of the boys was just extremely pessimistic about life, uh, just way overly so. And the other was an extreme optimist. And they just thought both of these were, were kind of problematic, so they brought him to, to see a psychologist. And uh, so the psychologist said, yeah, we want to we study this. It's, it's, it's not good to be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. And so he ran a test. So first, he took the pessimistic seven-year-old, and he took him to a room, and the room was filled with toys. But the seven-year-old immediately burst into tears, and he said, what's wrong? And he said, he said don't you want to play with the toys? And the seven-year-old said, I would just break them anyways. I'm not going to play with them. So then he took the seven-year-old optimist to another room, and he walked in the room, and it was filled with manure. And the seven-year-old squealed with delight, sounds like my seven-year-old if he saw a room of manure, ran and jumped in the pile of manure and began playing and digging into it. And the psychologist said, what are you doing? Um, and, the, and the psychologist said to the seven-year-old, and the seven-year-old said, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. 
So Grover, you've worked in Washington for a long time, uh, a city filled with manure. You're, you're kind of known for being an optimist on, on making change better. Um, so there's my introduction for you. Please tell us a, a little bit about your career and, and where we're at now. Sure. Um, back in 1993, when Clinton got elected, had Democratic House and Senate, we were very concerned he was going to do a series of power grabs uh, on government-run health care and, and voting rules and everything else. Uh, so we put together a meeting whose job was to stop government-run health care. We put 20 people in a room uh, from the Hill, from outside groups, and pretty quickly we decided that if you wanted to stop Obama, not Obamacare, Clinton care, Hillary care, you had to slow everything down from gun control to spending issues. Uh, and the group grew to 40, and uh, it's now at about 150 uh, in a room somewhat bigger than, uh, than this in DC. We meet weekly. And so our goal there is to bring all of the structures, businesses, uh, taxpayer groups, the NRA, think tanks, members of Congress, leadership, guys from the White House, um, to make sure everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And so I think trying to convene uh, activist groups, elected officials, business groups, individual uh, act, uh, activists, and making sure that people know what, what's going on, what are they missing. Uh, we can get in silos, and I, I think the pessimism comes if you work one issue for 30 years, you can be very frustrated how long it takes to move the needle. Um, sometimes you're losing for 30 years um, on issues that are important to fight, but it's no fun to be in charge of the one that's moving backwards. Uh, but if you work with all of the various uh, structures of the center right, you're never losing everywhere, so you don't get depressed. And you're never winning everywhere, so you don't get cocky and go, well, I guess this is, this is easy, it's all downhill. Uh, in the dozens of issues, and again, it, we'll have uh, 30 people present for three minutes each for an hour and a half meeting. So you get 30 different people. That, um, there's a guy who shows up, and every month or two he presents on the legalization of hemp, which is rope, right? But because it had THC in it, like a small amount, like marijuana, they banned it when they banned marijuana. And there's a movement that's been very successful legalizing hemp rope. Uh, it's not a drug. Uh, and the speaker, of the, ha uh, the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is the lead guy. Uh, and it's basically legal most places now. But four or five years ago, it was illegal everywhere. And it's not the most important issue in the world. To him, it is. But but you know, but it was fascinating to see. You know, here's what's happening, here's what's happening in this state. And then everybody had a sense of how the arc of that effort was going. And then he got to see what everybody else uh, was doing. So having the center-right movement in touch with each other, there are now 41 states that have meetings like this at the state level, including uh, Michigan, uh, with the Mackinac Institute organizing it, uh, and 26 countries. So in uh, Warsaw, Poland, and Britain, and uh, Paris and I mean all the European capitals uh, and Hong Kong and Tokyo and uh, three different cities in Alaska in uh, Australia. Uh, Australia is basically three cities in the desert, but you know so but the three cities are organized uh, and so we have a much more connected center right where people know what other people are doing. So you're not lonely. You don't get depressed. Um, you don't think because you won one issue that you're a genius and, and you can, we can just do everything because just maybe you got the easy issue <laughs> that you were working on. Um, but if there's an insight that I brought to the movement, it's why are the, why are the 150 people in that room? Okay, what, what, why is this, right? And there used to be something in the 70s and 80s um, where people would tell you, well, there are three stools to the Reagan coalition, social conservatives, economic conservatives, foreign policy conservatives. Okay, I understand economic conservatives. Adam Smith got that. What's a foreign policy conservative? Absent the Soviet Union, is it lots of wars, few wars? You know, what, what, what does it mean to be a social, uh, foreign policy conservative? It's not a settled issue. Uh, and what's a social issue? Make, you know, make a list. What are you talking about? Uh, and a better way to understand it is that everybody around our table on the center right is there 
because on their vote moving issue, what they want from the government is to be left alone. Homeschoolers, let me educate my kids. Charter schools, let me stay in a charter school, don't pull me into, uh, in, in, into government unionized, bureaucratized schools. Uh, the Second Amendment community, 19 million Americans with concealed carry uh, permits. Uh, 19 million Americans, 7% of Americans, adults, have the right to carry concealed. And if you take California and New York out of it, it's, it's, it's like 8 and 9% of the rest of the country. Uh, it's more than 10% of 10 different states. I mean, this is, uh, and if you vote on the Second Amendment, and the concealed carry people often tend to, it's not just hunters. Hunters are fine. Every year for a few weekends, they annoy Bambi's relatives. But if you want a personal relationship with your firearm, it's the concealed carry community, much more active even, even than, than hunters. Um, so you go, the, the various communities of faith, uh, you know, what do they want? They want to be left alone to practice their faith, tr transmit it to their children. They're not, they don't want Baptist stamps. They're not asking the government to do something for them or make everybody be an Episcopalian or something. Um, and so we can have a very ecumenical religious liberty movement where they don't agree who gets to heaven and how because the guy on the other side of the table completely misunderstands scripture. He's going to Hades. But if I'm free to go to heaven, that idiot has to be completely free to get it wrong. Um, so the taxpayer movement, if you vote on, your, if you vote on taxes, you're in, if that's what moves you. On taxes, it tends to be a little episodic on when they're raising your property taxes, many voters on taxes. If they're trying to raise the income tax, many voters on taxes. If nobody's done anything to change it for a while, they go back and do other things and focus on it. So it's not quite like some of the lifestyle issues. The vapors, 10 million Americans vape, adults. 10 million adults vape. They elected uh, your senator nearby from Wisconsin. Ron Johnson elect was elected, organized every vape shop in the state in 2016, ran 50,000 votes ahead of Trump, uh, and uh, ran on the basis that he was going to protect against regulations and taxes on vaping. Every vape store had his material. Um, so it may not be your key issue, but if it's somebody's key issue and what they want is to be left alone, I want them in the room. The knife rights movement, which I didn't know existed, uh, but a number of years ago, I met the folks who run that campaign. And many of you may remember in the early 60s, there was a wave of murders with switchblades in movies. And so all the legislators around the country watched West Side Story and, and Rebel Without a Cause and decided they had to pass a law against this, this all these people getting killed with switchblades. And they passed laws against basically <laughs> knives. Um, 18 states have completely legalized knives, um, including New York, by the way. The ACLU was on our side on that. Um, so we get some very interesting left-right coalitions when it comes to liberty fights. Uh, so we're always looking for new groups that the government's damaging, threatening, annoying, poking, robbing, um, and say, come work with us. Come sit at our table and we will work with you on your fight to be left alone, but understand everybody around here, they just want to be left alone too. That's why we have a low maintenance coalition, because the guy who wants to make money all day can look across the table at the guy who wants to go to church all day and say, that's not what I do, and they both look over at the guy who wants to fondle his guns all day and says, that's not how we spend our time, but it's not necessary that people agree what to do with your liberty, just don't damage anyone else. And if the government's messing with you, you're an ally in making a government small enough to leave us all alone. Um, and so that coalition has been very successful, uh, and we lose when we forget why people vote and why people are attracted to us. And you can't step on people's toes because you thought it was an interesting <laughs> idea um, or feed somebody to the government. They will not forgive you, forgive you for that. So the Center-right coalitions around the country and now around the world um, have really helped make sure everybody understood why are we all in the room, why are we all on the same side. Don't bring an idea that crushes Fred over there because <laughs> that won't fly. You know, bring an idea that moves towards liberty so everybody in the room goes, that's fine. They may not care. You know, it's not the most important issue to me. I'm not going to go spend all day on that issue, but I'm certainly not opposed to it, and maybe I can help.
Yeah, so it's a good <coughs> it's a good summary of that kind of leave leave us alone coalition. Um, and you work obviously on a lot of different issues. Your bread and butter for a long time has been um, taxation and lower overall net taxes, federal level, state level. Um, David mentioned in the introduction, you got a huge win, 2017 for the first major um, tax reduction. Grover was here earlier in the year at that time, and it was a time where it looked kind of unlikely. It was tough to pull the coalition together, and um, you made some predictions that panned out for that largely of, of how the reform went. So here we are a couple, couple years later. Um, so how's the reform going? Um, can you talk about that at the federal, not just federal level, but maybe across the states? Obviously, um, because of some changes in the tax code, there's been some states that have um, had to reevaluate their tax systems. Um, so how's it going overall? Sure. Um, it's going well. Uh, may re-elect a president, may win us a house back. Uh, it's going that well. The tax cut that passed, that uh, President Trump took the Republican tax proposal that had been worked on for more than a decade and said, well, this idea of taking the business tax, the corporate rate, down to 25 um, is a good idea, but we should take it to 15. And because he started at 15, we ended up at 21. If we'd started at 25, <laughs> we'd have ended up at 31. Um, he, uh, and we came close to having 15, but we got, went up to 21, but down from 35. We had the highest corporate income tax in the world, okay? Stupider than France is not where you want to be. Um, everybody else in the world saw that we'd successfully, in the United States, dropped the corporate rate um, and it down to, to 35 from 50, down to 35. And they said, that's great, and they went down towards the low 20s. We're at 35, and we never caught up with them. And, and the Democrats would always, yeah, we should do something. We should maybe go to 32, 33. Um, and uh, if you were to give us a trillion dollar net tax increase, um, is the second half of that sentence from the Democrats. Uh, and so we got to down to 21, and we got individual rates, uh, uh, median income, family of four, $70,000 uh, is, is the median for that group. Um, got taxed at about $2,000. Single parent, $45,000, got a $1,300 tax cut. Um, very good for people with children, very good for people who invest and save and, and work. Um, but the number that really is interesting in terms of what moved and I think swings the election is the median income for everybody with when Trump came in with $61,000. And that's median, meaning half people make less, half people make more. So during the Obama years, Obama complained about the fact that during his presidency, <coughs> the top 5 10% got 90 plus percent of all the benefits from economic growth that took place during Obama. That his, the growth was really at the high end of incomes, not across the board. Um, and so giving a billion dollars to Bill Gates doesn't change that $61,000 median at all. Bill Gates is one guy, right? Um, what happened is, in three years, 61,000 went to um, 65,000, up $4,000. The median income in the country went up $4,000. In the previous 16 years, all of Obama, all of Bush, it went up $1,000. So $1,000. Why were people grumpy <laughs> going into 16? A lot of people had not seen real movement in their income. They'd seen cost of living go up, but not real movement in their income. And $4,000. That's why you have a lot of, of <coughs> cheerful. This is, why, this is why impeachment. Why impeachment? Because they don't want to talk about the economy, because they don't want to talk about jobs, because they don't want to talk about growth in income, growth in wages, uh, growth in the median income, not just higher income. Um, and so that's driven by the tremendous progress we had on taking the corporate rate down, which got a lot more investment into the United States. There was two, three plus trillion dollars locked overseas because our stupid tax policy said, if you earn money in France, American company, you pay taxes in France. And then if you're stupid enough to bring it back to the United States and invest it here, we tax it again. And what Trump and the Republicans said is, you know, when you work in, you 
build something in France or you sell something in France, you make money, you pay the French taxes because it's France, and then you want to bring the money back? No penalty, just bring it back. Uh, and the guys over at Apple brought $90 uh, billion dollars back immediately, and they had like another $300 billion that they were looking to bring back. They just weren't sure what they were going to do with it. And they said, well, we're bringing 90 back, but you know what? We're no longer reporting where we keep our money because it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if it's in the Bank of London or in Wichita because it's available to be spent in the United States anytime we want. So we're not, we're not, we don't report something that doesn't matter, so it's a little hard to get as much credit from <laughs> all the good stuff we're doing because nobody has to keep track of where they've got the money um, if they're just keeping it in the bank. Um, but it's being invested in the United States, and instead of companies leaving the United States, remember um, Burger King got bought by the Canadian-Brazilian consortium? Same Burger King, same burgers, same people, same everything, except it's a Canadian housed company, not an American company. Taxes were less, significantly less. Warren Buffett organized that, <laughs> that deal. Um, the guy thinks your taxes should be raised, but he or does all of his investing based on tax policy. Um, so we aren't losing companies anymore. Matter of fact, I had an interesting conversation with the Prince of Liechtenstein, where they have like a 4% corporate tax. He said, if you guys get, if you actually take that rate to 15, investors will move out of Liechtenstein into the United States, even though we're at four and you're at, you go to 15, because that's not enough We'll lose people. He's losing some at 21, uh, but we do need to get to 15 as the president wants after the next election. So uh, one of the issues on the t tax policy that's interested to me is obviously um, a lot of what you're working on is net tax cuts, um, an issue that we're seeing increasingly with um, Foxconn in Wisconsin and with Amazon is you have states competing over doing select tax incentives or, 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 or select grants to corporations. It's a big issue here here in Michigan. It has historically, uh, though the state's pulled back quite a bit from that. Um, so what's your take on that? I mean, as a conservative, obviously we like lower taxes, and that is lower taxes, um, but there's a selectivity to it. Um, what's the overall take? Well, the challenge is when you say to Amazon, if you put something in New York, we will cut your taxes, you will have low taxes for 10 or 15 years. Um, why not do that for the businesses in New York, for the small businesses that are already there? Why not have everybody have lower taxes? You don't get the ribbon cut in for that. Yes, well, okay, <laughs> you answered the question. That's why they do it. Uh, governors who actually never create wealth, um, governments create wealth the way leeches create blood. Um, <laughs> the, they don't create wealth. Okay, they just don't. But they like to be there while they, you know, they stole money from other people and they gave it to somebody else and then they go like they did something and cut the ribbon. Um, and that's fine for governors and mayors, but it's not very good for the small business down the road, which is paying the higher taxes and the new guy shows up because they've got some, you know, they're, they're the in industry that decade. Uh, won't be next decade, <laughs> but they are right now and they like, everybody wants that industry where they are. Uh, I remember, in Ma I grew up in Massachusetts prior to emigrating to the United States, and <laughs> in Massachusetts, um, we were whining bitterly about losing all those wonderful uh, textile jobs to, the, to South Carolina. Um, anyway, uh, but we were losing them because our taxes were ridiculous. Uh, so I think you're better off as a state, be the low tax state. People move to the states with no income tax. There are nine of them. Um, flat taxes, single rate taxes. Again, Massachusetts, we have a single rate tax, 5%. Okay? You'd think left wing Massachusetts, the income tax would be higher. No, because it's a single rate tax. And if you have a single rate tax and a politician says they've got a really good idea and you're all paying for it, people go, well, then we're all listening. Explain the really good idea slowly. Um, and really good ideas um, are fewer if we're all paying for it. That's why Obama and Clinton would go, I'm only going to raise taxes on the top 2%. They said and lied, they raised taxes on everybody. But to get elected, they said, I'm going to raise taxes on the top 2%. So the rest of you may want to step outside. This isn't going to be pleasant. You might be a little loud in here while I'm getting the money that we need, but it doesn't affect you, okay? Um, well, then more ideas sound pretty good if somebody else is paying for it. Uh, at the end of the day, though, this is, uh, 
when our friends um, Warren and Sanders and all these other Democrats talk about massive government programs and Medicare f for all and so on, and they say, we want to be like Europe. They haven't finished the paragraph. Be like Europe, big social welfare spending. Be like Europe, who pays for that? Taxes on rich people in Europe are not significantly higher than America, not even higher in general. What matters, the difference is that Europeans pay about a 20% value-added tax, which is sales tax at every level of, of production. Uh, most Americans have a sales tax significantly less than 10%. Europeans have a much broader VAT, much broader sales tax. Um, at all, VAT is a French word, means big government. Um, and so you start with a 20% rake off on the middle class and poor people, okay? 20% of everything you buy, the government takes. And the income tax on the median income person in the United States is significantly lower than the, how they, than the tax on the median income in Sweden or France or Germany or Belgium or Norway, which has a lovely gas and they still screw everybody with income taxes. Um, so Europe gouges the middle class with income rates 10 and 20 percent higher than American middle income people. They also tax high income people fairly heavily and they have a 20 percent VAT. That's how they pay for it. It's not paid for by rich people in Europe. All the smart people left Europe a long time ago, came here. Um, <laughs> and you know, everybody who could play tennis left Sweden when they decided to have a 104 percent income tax rate for a couple of years. The lady who wrote Pippi Longstockings, right? You know, she stayed. She's the only person who stayed in Sweden after they had a 104 percent income tax rate for a while. Uh, they brought it down. Sweden actually is moving radically f towards a free market position. They have full school choice in Sweden. Full school choice. No death tax. No wealth tax. Why no wealth tax? They tried one. It's too stupid for words, right? There were 12 countries in Europe that had a wealth tax like Elizabeth Warren wants. Only three still do. And one of them's France, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you, we obviously we, we talked a lot about the tax reform. Um, we talked about some other issues going on. So with the Trump administration as a whole, what are some other areas um, you think he's doing a good job on? And then also, what are some areas you think he's falling short on? What's he not doing well? Sure. Um, he has changed the world with lower taxes. Very helpful, positive. The deregulation is as big a deal. Uh, we have deregulated, and we now have a much stronger energy and fracking. Remember, the left wanted to shut down fracking. Had, had Hillary won, she would have shut down fracking, which allows us not to care when half of Saudi Arabia blows up for a week or something. And it just didn't even change the markets or anything. Iran goes off grid. Venezuela goes off grid. This would have had us lined up uh, you know, in gas lines for weeks. Uh, but because we are now producing so much more natural gas and, and energy, uh, we're in a much stronger position strategically. Russia is poor because we frack. Okay, this idea that the president, you know, the Russian wanted <laughs> the president to be president, they spent a lot of money stopping fracking in Europe, the Soviets, the Russians. Um, and because we frack, prices internationally are lower, and 45% of the Soviet budget's oil and natural gas. So every time we drop that, that price doesn't go up, they can't afford to do all the stupid, destructive things that they'd like to do. Um, they would have loved to have had Hillary Clinton and the anti-fracking crowd uh, in, in the White House. Uh, the judges, the judges, the judges. He's appointing judges that are 10 years on average less old than, um, than Obama did, okay? Obama did left-wing guys who didn't necessarily have to be any good, you just had to be left-wing. We've got an extremely competent, highly educated, people who've read the Constitution all the way through, the whole thing, and, um, and like it, as opposed to, oh my goodness, this will never do. Um, so, and they're younger, okay? So I think they're gonna file impeachment against the president on age discrimination on those judges. But, um, so you've, this changes the next 25 years of American history. We've been fight, we've been playing a game of rugby or football or something on a uh, aircraft carrier 
and the aircraft carrier has been drifting left. And we think we're scoring goals and going back and forth. But the ground underneath us, because of left-wing Supreme Court decisions for 60 years, has been shifting leftward towards bigger government and more power in the government. And it doesn't matter how many elections you make and how many you know, touchdowns you throw on your aircraft carrier, if the whole thing underneath you keeps shifting in the wrong direction, you are going backwards away from liberty. And that's what we've been doing. Um, the left is unhappy because no longer can they cheat. We're going to anchor the, the aircraft carrier. It's not moving. As a matter of fact, we're going to drag it back towards center, towards the Constitution. So he's reestablishing rule of law. Um, the, and those decisions, and, and labor unions can no longer steal money from government workers as a condition of employment. Okay? That was one of the decisions that was made, uh, which is hundreds of millions and over time billions of dollars a year that goes to the left. It's a huge. Um, uh, Supreme Court case that got very little attention because press doesn't want to talk about it, um, but it's making real progress in Michigan and in other um, states. So deregulation, lower taxes, um, the judges and rule of law, um, the challenges, I, I, I'm not a big fan of, of tariffs. Um, if we, I hope we can get the Chinese to be more honest with us and stop stealing our intellectual property. I don't know that tariffs are the right tool for that, but if it works, I'll be very happy. Um, and, but right now, it's expensive to have tariffs, um, uh, expensive the American economy. So um, got a better deal with Canada, got a very good pro uh, deal set forward with uh, Japan. They are moving for s more serious trade agreements around the uh, country. He hasn't gotten us any worse. Um, so I think reasonably cheerful in general, and he's going to do the right thing on vaping. They got him off balance a little bit, cheated, they went to his wife. Um, and uh, uh, vaping is the 10 million Americans who vape instead of smoking cigarettes. They feel good about themselves. They will put 500 people into a state legislature if you try and tax or regulate them. They help, we've won elections, not just the Wisconsin Senate race, but uh, House races and state legislative races. And the Democrats are now calling for banning vaping, and the Trump administration is almost certainly going to come out for it. no ban on flavors for adults. Don't kids, you can't get access to them, but not, uh, but adults can, and that is a voting block that can swing whole states. Um, and it's a freedom. Pe people should be able to um, vape water vapor instead of smoke cigarettes. Um, th what did I leave out on the the good or the bad that you thought I was going to? Oh, you want my list? Yeah, because I'm, <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm leaving something out. He has been very hard working. Uh, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd wonder is, um, related to that tax reform, we've, we've seen pretty high budget deficits. What's your take on that? Is that a temporary uh, thing? What's the? Oh, very good question. Um, here was the plan. Past tax reform, year one. We did it. Year two, the Paul Ryan block granting of all welfare programs to the states and capping it. What the Republicans forced uh, uh, Clinton to do, and remember they, they passed it three times, Clinton signed it the last time, and then they block granted aid to families with dependent children and renamed it TANF, so we couldn't find it anymore. Um, it's now TANF, but it's aid to families with dependent children, welfare. Um, we block granted it to the states. Every state except Hawaii had average reductions in spending of 30% on welfare because the states could manage it better. They could decide who needed it and who didn't have it. They had a lot less fraud, not none, but a lot less. Um, the plan that was put forward and we're ready to go with would block grant Medicaid and either eliminate Obamacare or block grant whatever you wanted to call Obamacare, food stamps, and these other means-tested welfare programs. If you get the money because you're you, because you're poor, not because you did something like pay into Social Security or Medicare, those were going to be block granted. And then some idiot lost a Senate seat in Alabama. And we lost our margin to be able to do this because you had John McCain, who might decide it would he'd get the giggles by screwing us. And so he didn't, couldn't count on that vote. Uh, the lady in Alaska, who I've never figured out, um, Murkowski, no, I'm an ordain, but it's not, I can't figure out what m makes her move. Um, and, <laughs> And you worry about Maine. Maine always wants to be with us. She's a serious, real Republican. She actually is a Republican, unlike Alaska. Dad was a Republican. Alaska wasn't. Um, and, um, but if you didn't have that Alabama vote, you weren't guaranteed that you could get to 50 
or 51, and so we didn't get to do the entitlement reform. When we have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican President, and somebody sane out of Alabama, um, then we will do entitlement reform with the means-tested welfare programs. That saves trillions of dollars over time, and it's really where the challenge is and the problems are uh, in terms of cost. There's only so much you can do by saving a certain amount of money on domestic discretionary. There's plenty, but it's not enough to get you out of the problem. You've got to deal with entitlements. And so they were ready to do it, and that includes the guys in the Trump administration who I thought of as more moderate. They were all go. Um, so their eyes on the fo focus, but there's no point in talking about it if you don't have the votes because the other team will just try and scare people and say, ah, ah, ah. Um, but uh, that was a challenge um, and remains a challenge. And I hope we can, I believe after this next election, we'll have 51 solid votes in the Senate for reform. There's every reason to think we only need 18 House seats to pick up. Um, this is very doable. Uh, and Trump is polling better than the other team at present. So uh, reminder, if you have any questions, write them down. Um, we'll gather them. David, David Gunther will uh, get them up to me. Um, so last question before we go to the audience. Um, but what do you, do you have any predictions for, for 2020? Um, I mean, for me, I, uh, after 2016, I've given up on making political <laughs> predictions. Um, but, you know, we brought you in here. So w what's going to happen in 2020? Uh, in 2020, uh, I do think that, well, I think it's more likely than not that the president wins. The economics says he should win. The left's mishandling of uh, this in entire impeachment thing um, has just been amazing. Um, that they, but they are so rattled because the economy is doing well and they can't talk about that. They're so rattled because when organized labor isn't allowed to steal money from government workers as a condition of employment, their funding sources fade. Uh, what they are doing, and if they succeed, it will be because they took Ralph Nader's advice. Um, Ralph Nader has a book. It's about that thick, and it's bright yellow, uh, and it's called Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. And he wrote it about 10 years ago. Uh, gave me a copy, because I'm the not very well disguised villain in the book. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and, but it's all about how a handful of billionaires come in and buy the next election, okay? Because he had felt we just had, you know, Bloomberg, Steyer, that whole crowd, okay? And the Democratic Party, used to talk about organized labor, trial lawyers, stuff like that. Now it's <laughs> people with surnames, right? <laughs> it's some guy who, you know, Bloomberg, you know, $50 billion. And he's, he's putting $160 million in to ban vaping. Um, he talked about half a billion committed to buy the, the House protection for the House and Senate. Um, it's a lot of money being put in there. So if, that, if I have a worry, it's that they're listening to Nader by the next election. Money does matter on that, uh, on that score. Uh, I think we'll hold the Senate. That's looking uh, quite good. The Michigan, a lot of uh, good uh, sense on the Michigan Senate race. People are, um, if you do that, then we definitely have the Senate. If you do that, we have the votes to do everything we need to continue to do on judges and so on. Um, Alabama, we should get back because the crazy people are not winning the election uh, at present. Uh, and um, the we worry about uh, Arizona, we worry about Maine, um, worry about North Carolina, we worry about Colorado. Um, but frankly, I think we'll carry all those states. Great. All right. So we got some uh, questions here from the audience. As a conservative proponent of small government, which of these is the most important to you? Low taxes, low spending, or lower deficits? Okay. The deficit is an unimportant and uninteresting number that is the difference between two important and interesting numbers. How much the government takes from you and how much they spend in waste, okay? Um, and the deficits, the difference between those two numbers. The deadweight cost of government is how much it spends. The total deadweight cost of government is how much it spends plus the regulatory burden. Uh, and that's higher than just government spending. It includes all sorts of one to two trillion dollars in regulatory costs imposed uh, on people. 
So you want taxes as low as possible, particularly to have more growth, which gives you more revenue because the economy is bigger, but you need the government spending to come down because that's the deadweight cost of government. And if we focus on spending as a percentage of the economy and bringing that number down, then you can't screw up. What the left wants to say is, oh, look at the deficit. Oh, well, there are two ways to solve the deficit, aren't there? We could cut spending, but not today, or we could raise taxes, okay? And so the left wants to always say, look at the deficit, and they've got a solution, raise taxes. We have a solution, spend less, but theirs is equally valid according to the theory if it's the deficit, but raising taxes hurts your effort to reduce spending because no Democrat has ever raised taxes ever in the history of the world to bring the deficit down. They raise taxes to spend the money. They're not raising taxes to balance the budget. This is not what they're up to. They raise the money to spend. And if you give them more money, they will spend it. They went to Reagan in 82, said we'll give you $3 of tax spending cuts for every $1 of tax increase. The tax increase happened, the spending cuts never happened, spending went up, not down, up when they did, they cheated Reagan. Then Bush came along, and to Reagan's credit, he was lied to by Bob Dole and some liberal Republicans who, the, who joined in cheating him, so he thought he could trust them because they were wearing the same jersey that he was, but that they weren't playing for the same team. Um, and then eight years later, in 90, George Herbert Walker Bush was offered one dollar of tax hike for two dollars of spending cuts, which I thought was just insulting. It's like, you're a cheaper date, you get two. We, you get two dollars of imaginary spending cuts. Reagan got three dollars of imaginary spending cuts. I mean, if you're playing with Confederate currency, why not make it 10 to one, make the guy feel good, okay? Then you take him, but, um, and he got took. There was no spending reduction in that package. Tax increase, Bush signed the tax increase, spending went up up faster than it had been expected to go without any deal at all. So neither Reagan or Bush got any deficit reduction from those two budget deals, nor any spending reduction. Focus on spending, focus on spending. Don't let the deficit distract you. Focus on spending and keep it as low as possible. So this person notes that <coughs> the largest item in their family budget is state, local, and federal taxes. So I think they're looking for some advice because they ask, what are the uh, three to four lowest cost tax states? I, I guess another way of looking at that, what are some states that are some models for how states should be? Sure. Florida, no income tax, generally um, low tax, they have a sales tax. Um, New Hampshire, no broad-based sales tax, no income tax, uh, high property taxes. Uh, uh, Texas. Um, fairly good state. It's had 10 years with a uh, Republican Speaker of the House governing with the Democrat votes, unfortunately. So 10 years, that's why you've never heard anything decent coming out of Texas for the last 10 years, because you've had a bad speaker who just sat on things, uh, as opposed to other states like North Carolina, which is uh, on track to get rid of its corporate and individual income tax uh, as the years move forward. Uh, you want to move to a state that's cutting taxes, not just a state that has low taxes. States that have low taxes that are raising taxes, by the time you get there, they're going to be high tax states. So go with the states that are reducing taxes um, or that have a flat rate by constitution income tax because you're safer. Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned one of the big issues is regulation, and we talk a lot about at the federal level. Um, what, what can states do to take on regulation. Um, I saw Senator Nesbitt came in here. He's chair of Senate regulation. So if you don't like regulations in Michigan, go talk to him. Um, what can states do on the regulation oh, side? Thank you. I couldn't see him. I didn't um, know if he wanted to raise his hand because you're going to get 30 people in a little bit. But. Uh, no, we used to work together at HR. Um, and there's lots of stuff on, on deregulation at, at the state level. Um, the move to limit occupational licensing rules. Uh, uh, Arizona has a law that I strongly would, would recommend you take a look at, um, and that is if you have a license to do something in any of the other 49 states, come to uh, Arizona and your license, we recognize your license, okay? You don't have to spend another 3,000 hours to become a cosmetologist or something. Um, 
and get relicensed in a different state or a realtor or something like that. Yeah, my younger sister is married to a guy in the Army, so she's a teacher, has to look at certification everywhere she goes. We've been trying for years to get an exemption eat for spouses of military guys, and I don't know how much luck we've had in the states, but the, one, the Arizona rule solves everybody's problem. The other one is a number of states, uh, you guys have a fairly good Uber law, get laws that l allow Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, all the new innovative companies to just simple rules and don't let cities and state, the local governments screw it up um, and just let these people do this stuff. I mean, with this, this is so exciting that we've got new companies starting up. No one was ever going to reform the taxi uh, cartel. cartel. Ever, ever. You could have spent forever suing them, lobbying them, writing strongly worded letters, um, and nothing would ever happen. Instead, what we had was an act of corporate civil disobedience. Uber started up because they had laws that didn't allow Uber to exist, so they were criminals, and they started giving people rides, and by the time the government noticed it, and the, 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 there were too many drivers and too many riders, and they couldn't stop it. Um, and uh, I've been to countries where they did stop it, you know, and um, road in Chile uh, and called Uber, and the guy said, could you sit in the front seat with me? I said, okay. He said, because if you're in the back seat, they'll think I'm an Uber driver, like I am, but if you sit in the front seat, you look like my friend. So I drove in the front seat. But, I mean, they're, they're literally playing cops and robbers while trying to earn a living uh, and get people to the airport on time. So simple rules, and the other one is, the other thing a state can do is preempt local governments from stupid, okay? Iowa has a very good law. Anything a local government does that costs the state money that gets in the way of their getting a sales tax, like banning plastic bags or straws or pet stores, I mean, there's a, the whole list of things that local governments want to mess with. It's slightly longer than Leviticus. And it just goes on and on and on about what they don't want local governments to do. And they pick the, the city without a pet store and ban pet stores. Who cares? No one's going to fight it, right? And then they get five cities like that. And then they go to the stake up. Oh, we have to have a regulation. We've got five different rules on pet stores. And this, the world's going to end because there's comp no rules on pet stores passed at the local level. Knock it off. Um, don't let local governments do crazy, stupid things. Stop it. Preempt it at the state level. That's the first thing you have to do on Airbnb regulation and, you know, the gig economy regulation, those sorts of things. But also, you, you'd be amazed at the, I mean, who thought that, you know, plastic straws were going to be a thing, right? Um, the, um, I mean, all the plastic in the world comes from like six rivers that aren't anywhere near us. They're in Asia and they're in Africa and all of the stuff you see on TV, nothing comes from the United States. That doesn't matter. Some guy in a little town decides we have to ban plastic straws. You have to have those little pla the paper straws that crumple and everything. Yeah. Um, so uh, one the best thing you could do at state level is forbid local governments from playing games like that. Yeah, on the, on the Uber issue, I'd read, you know, parents spent all this time telling uh, their kids don't get in cars with strangers, and then now everyone's going around hailing rides with people that are strangers, so um, that's innovation. Uh, so with the higher standard deduction in the 2017 Reform Act, what's the impact been on charitable giving? Charitable giving, uh, I, I don't know specifically, but, but ch during the Reagan years when we cut marginal rates and did all sorts of things, um, charitable, driven is, charitable giving is driven by income how much um, disposable income people have. So when the country gets richer, they give more contributions. I'm not particularly big on tax deductibility of multi-million dollar contributions, largely because they all go to left-wing schools um, and, and museums that have things on the wall they claim are art, but they're not. Um, so <laughs> I would prefer to say, look, you know, you give a million dollars to charity if you want, but if you do it after that, do it after taxes. I don't think we should, you know, if you're rich and you want to do that stuff, I don't, we should not be paying for that um, effort. Uh, let's take rates down further. Let's get rid of the death tax. Um, we have a lot of good things that we can do. I've, um, but uh, on the charitable giving front, people give more when they have more money, and I don't, I wouldn't micromanage the tax code to try and <laughs> drive that. I'd rather 
have taxes as low as possible, and then let the growth in people's incomes make it easier for them to contribute. Um, you were talking a little bit earlier about the corporate reinvestment dollars and money coming back in the country. Um, so this person asked, how much has been used for capital equipment, jobs, higher wages, versus just stock repurchases? That's one of the, the arguments against the reform. Okay. Um, nobody in here wrote that question. But the, the argument that <laughs> stock repurchases are a problem. Okay. Um, somebody, the, Apple, um, decides they're going to buy, um, uh, bring a bunch of dollars back from overseas, where the alternative is to build a factory over there or something with it, bring it back here and buy a million dollars of Apple stock. Who'd they buy it from? Some American who had a million dollars of Apple stock and for whom this is their investment money. They're not going to take it and go to lunch with it. This is what they invest. So they sell Apple because they don't like Apple anymore. They like something else better, and they invest it in something else. This is not a net reduction in investment in the country. And I want, if Apple says, you know, if we had a billion dollars, what's the best place we could invest it in the whole universe? Us own more of Apple. Those are the guys who know, that's kind of insider trading, you know, really, if you ask me. They, they know what they're worth. They know what their plans are better than anyone. They go, we invest in us. We're going to take that billion dollars and put it in Apple because we've got this new stuff coming out. Um, so this argument that if you buy back your stock, what they're doing is you're investing in themselves. The money doesn't go away because you, um, uh, you bought the stock from somebody who owned it. Uh, and that person invests as well. So I very much like buybacks. I want to invest in a company that says, if we had a billion dollars, we'd invest it here, not someplace else. Um, and so it's a, the, the money comes back. Our job is not to micromanage, I mean, how individuals or companies spend their money. That's not our business, that's not the government's business, and the nerve of the Democrats to go, oh, well, yes, you should bring it back here, and, and now we'll spend it for you. That's the easiest way to get it to go back to France, for crying out loud. I think we'll play over there, not here, if you guys are going to tell us how to invest our money. So th I, I realize that's the left's, uh, they say it so often that people think it makes some sort of sense, you know, they, they buy back their stock. That, that doesn't sound like build factory, but um, you're, if you're investing in your own company, that's a good thing to do, and you want all of that money to be allocated, all that capital to be allocated to the highest and best use, and no government knows the answer to that question. Uh, this is kind of an interesting, unique question. So um, would you support keeping congressmen and senators at home rather than in Washington, D.C.? I, I suppose the idea being you can vote online, you can do a lot of stuff online. Could they just do that from, uh, from an office back home? I know it would affect your mm -hmm. housing prices because you live in D.C., Grover. But I do live in D.C., yes. Um, the, no, we need to get the bureaucracy down significantly, take those housing prices down. Uh, it's not just the congressmen and senators. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, how it would, I mean, legally you could, right? I mean, the Congress could set up its own rules. Uh, would that give you more local control? Who's going to be sitting over their shoulder while they're calling in or typing in their vote? Is it the local structure that wants government money, in which case this would not be good? Uh, or is it a town hall with 150 people, you know, and you explain how you're going to vote? So there are ways to do it. I tend to think that with the internet and so on, people have a much better idea of how their congressmen and senators vote today than they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's why we had all these Democratic senators from North and South Dakota, because they didn't have the telegraph thing going up until just recently. And they would, when they were in North and South Dakota, they'd say, oh, I vote, you know, against wasting, and they go to D.C. and they vote in committee and all this other stuff. And, and on the floor. The Pony Express didn't reach and let people know what they were No, it didn't. And, you know, nobody knew that Tom Daschle, who was a leader of the Senate, that the leading reporter in South Dakota for their newspaper was like, either his college roommate or his campaign manager for class president in college. And they were like this, and the guy was always on TV. He said, well, Dashiell did an amazing thing today, says independent reporter thinking. You know, nobody figured, we didn't have Google. <laughs> we didn't have you know, uh, high school books online so you could see who was who. Um, but we now actually have much better 
understanding in North Dakota. How, that's why we have two senators who are Republicans from North Dakota, because people in North Dakota know how they vote. Um, so I, I, I don't, I'm not against it. I just, I'd focus more on term limits. Term limits for committee chairs have changed the world in DC. When you term limit committee chairs, they don't term limit everybody, they term limit committee chairs, like a roving French Revolution every six years, chop off all their heads, and they all go away, and you get new people uh, coming up, and therefore, the good Republicans want to do something in those, those six years. It's also why we're something like 10 or 15 years younger than they, than Democrat Republicans are younger in Congress and particularly in leadership than the D's are. You, you saw when the Republicans lost control of the House and went to the Democrats, they have been closer to 20 years in the, in the Senate because our guys cycle out and their guys stay and just dry up. <laughs> All right, last question. Um, who's the most likely to be the Democratic nominee for president and why? Um, Biden, if he holds the African American vote and the two socialists keep splitting, you know, 12, 13 vote percent together, the guy with 35, that's how Trump won. Right? Trump was the unique guy, and then there were six complete look alike Reagan Republican senators, all of them uh, are governors, governors. They were all great, but the let's elect a Reagan Republican governor vote was divided by six, and Trump just kept winning all the way through. Um, and he is the sort of guy you know, sort of Obama vice president person, knows the labor unions, and then the, the guys who split the hard left, harder left, progressive vote, split it in two. And I don't think they like each other, and I don't think they can get together, and I'm not even sure their votes go back and forth that way. Um, so Biden has that going for him. The guy with $50 billion in the bank, Bloomberg, could buy an election. This is not impossible. So I say, I. I'm guessing, you know, just informed guess that either the guy who seemed like when Bob Dole was running and some wag said he's the one guy who can't be can't lose the primary and can't win the presidency, and you just watch this car wreck happen in front of you because you just couldn't stop it. Um, and Biden may be that car wreck, the one guy who couldn't be beaten in the primary but can't win the general. Uh, Bloomberg, I don't know how the party that hates rich people deals with Bloomberg. <laughs> Um, they don't. They didn't mind Kennedy because they know he didn't earn it, you know, so it didn't bother him. But, <laughs> but some of these billionaires that actually earned their money, um, I don't think they like them. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Grover. Thanks. For, thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Before we. Before we head out, um, there was one question I pulled from the SAC. Uh, Michael Fave, would you please stand up for a moment? Michael Fave, Senior Director of our Moral Mori Fiscal Policy Initiative. Moral, uh, very moral guy. Uh, there was one quart card submitted asking, what is the trend in Michigan for the state budget for the last, say, 20 years on a per capita basis adjusted for inflation? If this was your card, Michael Fave has your answer. <laughs> So uh, let's give Mike like one minute to go through his uh, memory and you don't have to answer it, you can find him individually. Or, okay, all right. Well, just looking at some of the numbers this morning, though, uh, in nominal terms, not real terms, and the budget's definitely been up and has managed to go up in $10 billion increments pretty fast. In fact, if the budget goes up, uh, gross spending 2% next year, it'll be our first $60 billion budget. And we were just at uh, 50 billion back in, I don't know, it's 2014 or so, I've got it written down here. And uh, 10 billion lower than that uh, just a few years uh, prior. So uh, spending has gone up it, fairly dramatically. It, I think in terms of state uh, budget spending from state resources, it has outstripped the rate of inflation by a, a significant margin. Not uh, as dramatic as it was during the, the 1990s, but certainly uh, enough to get my attention and, and wish that we reined in spending more here. Uh, we've taken some steps. I think the year-over-year -year budget, uh, when you include the supplemental, is up only 1.6% uh, over the last year. Back in the 90s, I uh, think the spending, state spending across the country in state capitals was uh, twice the rate of inflation. All right. 
Thank you for my, uh, Mike. Uh, he's gr our great in-house uh, fiscal policy resource, uh, one of many that we have with the Mackinac Center. A couple of quick things before uh, we uh, adjourn today. Uh, this is our final uh, Issues and Ideas luncheon of 2019. Uh, keep track of the Mackinac website and your emails for the dates and times and topics for the ones that we will have in 2020. Uh, we are so grateful for Auto Owners Insurance for sponsoring these lunches over the course of the year. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, and before you leave, we have a literature table with some of our recent publications there. Also some information on our Opportunity Michigan initiative. We are building a network of Michiganders who uh, believe in free markets, limited government, and are willing from time to time uh, as we have debates that are going on in our communities and issues uh, in, in the legislature, may be willing to lend their voices and time and talents to helping the cause. And Mike Lefebvre has his hand up. All right, so that's, uh, that's spending growth for you. So. Um, in any event, uh, appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, glad to end this year with a full room and look forward to seeing you in 2020. Thank you.